Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming today um, to our seminar which is going to be presented by Dr. Natalie Michals, who is here. Um, she's a postdoc student from Ghent University and is visiting UCC until the 9th of June, um, working with APC and also she's collaborated with Janice Arrington on Deddy Pack. So um, she's going to present today on psychosocial stress and a nutritional public health perspective and hopefully we'll have time for comments and questions at the end. Okay, okay thanks for the invitation. So starting with some nice picture uh, from Ghent. So I'm from Ghent University. Why this title? Because I'm working on psychosocial stress as a predictor for diet and obesity in the Department of Public Health within the unit of nutrition. So this is a very logical title. Before I start with the whole stress uh, story, I want to just briefly introduce what we are working on in our group. Uh, so we are working on nutrition, descriptive data, methodological aspects, but also what is coming before the nutrition, so predictors, why do we eat what we eat, and of course also a lot of disease outcomes um, in a public health perspective. As you see, we also have a little bit of food safety, uh, but it's a rather uh, minor part of what we are doing. It's mainly about nutrition, uh, food consumption surveys, dietary guidelines, uh, dietary indices, also anthropometric measurements, uh, a lot of biomarkers, which some of them will come back in my talk today. Uh, eating behavior and motivations, of course central, also overweight, cardiovascular and inflammatory outcomes, lifestyle, Apart from diet, we also have the physical activity and the sleep, which we always incorporate. Telomeres and aging is a certain aspect that can explain uh, why stress and nutrition have health effects. Psychosocial stress, which will be the, the main thing today. Also the gut microbiome, which will come into the picture later on. Uh, polyphenols, a certain uh, specific group of nutrients, which maybe can also be linked with the stress uh, story, but we still have to start with that one, and the cognitive function. So when I started my PhD, I had a question, what do I do when I'm stressed? So what do you do when you're stressed? And I think reactions can differ. Some of you will start worrying, some kind of rumination, thinking over and and over and again. Others will start to eat some chocolate, Belgian chocolate maybe. <laughs> uh, others will settle themselves in front of the TV, or maybe better, we'll go for a run to get rid of all uh, the problems. So, different reactions, and in fact, it's not the stress that kills us, it's not a reaction that kills us. So that's the perspective that we can have from a public health uh, ID. Um, we can influence the way how people react to it, of course, on a lifestyle basic, uh, aspect, but also psychological, how they cope with the stressors uh, to prevent increases in uh, stress hormones. To give you an overview, uh, first of all, I will tell you a little bit what is stress. I suppose some of you will already know um, why it's important, how to measure, uh, and overall the consequences. Uh, then, oh, then about the mechanisms of stress on lifestyle and at a positive, showing some own results of our CHIP study, giving you some implications and uh, last but not least some future projects and hopefully we can maybe see some uh, common interest. So medical consequences when we look at literature, a lot of medical uh, aspects have been linked to psychosocial stress. Just to give you an overview, the most well-known one is the heart. So uh, blood pressure, uh, cholesterol, heart attacks are often uh, cited as causes of stress. Uh, but we can also think about the brain, of course, a lot of uh, psychological disorders, uh, but also psychosomatic complaints like headache, um, but maybe also con some cognitive aspects, memory, um, concentration, and so on. But as you see, also some skin problems, muscle, bone, uh, digestive problems, uh, reproductive system, and also the immune system. Okay, we have stress, and maybe we can make it in two parts. We have the good stress and we have the bad stress. In fact, a little bit of stress is good. We need some stress. For example, when we were confronted in the prehistoric times with a lion or a mammoth, we have to respond to it. So, an acute stressor, a short-term stress reaction, is good for us. We have to react to it. 
So this is what we would think. There is a stressor. We increase our physiological response, but then we decrease. What is the bad stress, the stress that is often happened today? It could be that we have several stressors after each other, very frequent and short uh, interactions. It can be that we are confronted with the same stressor, but that we don't adapt to it. So normally, if we still have the same stressor, we should react less heavily to it with time. The prolonged response, so not shutting down, but staying high in our physiological response, or the opposite, an adequate response, so that we don't react to it. As you see, this is a lot of physiological uh, responses uh, that are responsible for this. So, just to give you an overview of the endocrinological aspects, we have two main stress axes. First of all, we have the cortisol. Uh, the cortisol uh, is produced by the adrenals, and this is mainly important uh, for the energy release. So, we're thinking about lipids, glucose, and also proteins. Uh, so, we will need the sugar to respond. We also break down some uh, proteins, and for the fats, it can be a little bit more complex. Uh, that will come in later in the story. But of course, other um, functions will be shut down. I'm thinking about growth, reproduction, immune function, a little bit less important in an urgent situation. The other aspect is autonomic activity. Then we think about the flight fight reaction. Um, what is here important? The physical reaction. We have to move to fight or to flight. So we need a lot of blood flow. So the heart has to work. And the blood flow has to go to the muscles to run or to fight, and it also has to go uh, to the lungs because we will need some more of oxygen. And of course, again, other aspects uh, will um, be lower, like digestion and reproduction. We have cortisol, we have an autonomic activity. How can we measure this in a public health perspective? The cortisol we can measure in several biosamples. The best well known, already uh, heavily used, is a serum cortisol. But of course, it has some limitations. First of all, the serum you have to have a blood withdrawal. So you can't do it just at home. You need a nurse or a doctor. You also have to store it in a freezer. Uh, and in addition, it only gives you a very acute idea of the stress. If I have to go for a blood withdrawal, I'm still a little bit stressed. So this acute stress can increase my cortisol and you will not see my basal stress level. So uh, you will have um, not a real idea what we want. So what uh, other people have done, they have collected 24 hour urine. So 24 hour, it's a longer time. You can do it at home, but still you need to put it in the freezer. 24 hour is not easy. You have to collect it the full day. Um, so we are looking for other things, saliva. This is uh, well used nowadays. Um, it's a good technique. Uh, you can uh, have some cotton rolls that you take in your mouth to collect the saliva. Problem here is uh, that we need to sample it several moments a day because the cortisol has a diurnal rhythm. So high in the morning, a little increase immediately after awakening, and then a decrease with lowest levels at uh, night. So we need really to respect the timing, and that's the most difficult one. Uh, in the ideal situation, you take it immediately after awakening, and then another uh, two samples within the first hour, and then ideally also a late evening sample, so that you can see the response in the morning and also decline over the full day. So it's not that easy to collect. Um, although it has good um, agreements with the stress report, so it, it's a good measure, but not easy to take. So people were looking for other possibilities, thinking about hair. So the idea is that blood um, is at uh, the, the root of the hair, and hair is growing approximately one centimeter each month. So if I take a hair sample, and I take the first three centimeters from the scalp, I can have a representation of my cortisol exposure during the last three months. So there's more a chronic exposure. It's easier to take. You just have to respect a certain position at the head. Of course, you still need a certain amount of centimeters. So it's not always easy uh, with, uh, with male people, with um, men. Uh, three centimeters is still a lot. 
uh, for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are still disadvantages about this hair, uh, and people are also looking for other uh, things, and then they were thinking about nails. It's the same perspective. Nails are growing very slowly, the cortisol can be integrated, uh, so you have the idea of chronic exposure. Uh, it's also easy to take, um, but as far as I know, there are not really validated uh, uh, data on this yet, but they are really doing this at this moment. Just to give you an overview of the possibilities with cortisol. Autonomic activity, I will be very short, so adrenaline, noradrenaline, also in the serum. Again, the limitation about blood withdrawal, about acute effects. Uh, people have done heart reliability measures, so measuring the electri electric uh, signal of the heart, the interbeat distance, you can do it with electrocardiography. We have done it in our child group with uh, a chest belt one that is uh, transferring the data to the computer with some uh, software. And you have a whole bunch of computed variables for parasympathetic and sympathetic activity. Nevertheless, it's mainly measuring the parasympathetic activity. Apart from this, we can also measure uh, the, heart, the autonomic activity in the saliva. This time it's amylase. Um, the idea is that the amylase will be higher in uh, stress uh, situations. Uh, but there you have the same uh, good and negative stuff uh, as a cortisol. It has a diurnal rhythm, the opposite direction, so low levels in the morning, high levels in the evening. So you have to take into account uh, multiple samples and a good timing again. And another one is about skin, skin conductance. So again, uh, different possibilities, and I'm sure there are also a lot of more of them, but this is more frequent used. Okay, so now we know how to measure it, then we can think, why will we measure it? Why is it important in diet and obesity? For this, I want to refer to Dr. Sapolsky. Uh, he was a biologist and he was interested in stress in baboons. Uh, so he went into the wilderness, observed these baboons for several weeks. Um, and he noticed that these baboons, same as human, they introduce stress themselves. So baboons, they have no predators, they have a lot of time because the food is quite easy to get. So what do they do with this time? They introduce some stressors between themselves. So normally in a, in a group of baboons you will see the high class and the low class baboons. And what, they, uh, what Sapolsky has observed was that the low class, the ones that feel some stress, uh, they had more diseases and they also died earlier. So this was the first sign of the importance of stress for biological health. Um, yeah. Of course, you can also do experiments later on with the baboons in a lab, and uh, they, um, after they were housed together, they were separated, the high and the low class. They give some pellets, the normal pellets, or the banana-flavored pellets. Banana-flavored, normally you would think um, the, the apes would like it. Uh, and indeed, mainly the low class baboons were taking more of these banana flavored pellets. So this is a link to diet. That stress may induce some preference for the more tasteful, the more comfort food. And that's what I will explain in the next slides. So the theory I started with six years ago already is that stress and adiposity can be related to each other in two directions. The main thing I will explain you is from stress to the positive. From stress to the positive, we have two main pathways. First of all, we have the physiological pathway, the cortisol, like I've already mentioned. With stress, we have high cortisol, and this cortisol can maybe favor the deposition of fat mainly in the central region, the waste region. Apart from that, we also have lifestyle, physical activity, diet, sleep, important predictors. Uh, of adiposity, we are known, but maybe also stress can influence them in an unhealthy way. So these are the two main pathways from stress adiposity. Nevertheless, also adiposity can increase stress by psychology and by also a lot of physiological pathways. Okay, from stress adiposity, look in the literature, do we have some evidence for this? First of all, looking in adults, indeed we have. So there are uh, several meta-analyses, I just give you here two of them, I will explain one of them. Uh, and they indeed show that it's bidirectional, so from stress to adiposity and from adiposity to stress. So it's really important to also look at the longitudinal perspective. 
When we look in children, evidence is there, but not that convincing. Uh, so no meta-analysis yet, some reviews are there. Uh, but what do they say? There is a lack of longitudinal studies. Uh, this mainly in the adolescents, so the older group of children, less in the younger group. And finally, we still lack evidence about mechanisms. Are they the same as we can see in the adults? So, in children, still a lack of literature. In adults, there is some evidence. Just to give you here the meta-analysis uh, from 2011, they collected 32 um, articles, longitudinal analysis, uh, in adults uh, with measured adiposity, so not self-reported uh, adiposity. I wanted to see whether there is a relation with work and life stress. Overall, here we see significant p-value, so stress was related to more adiposity. Nevertheless, when we look at the separate articles, we see that most of them have null effects. Some of them have the same, the increasing effects of stress with higher adiposity, but even two of them show that stress was related to lower adiposity. So it's a little bit conflicting. And we will go over it in, uh, in some other slides. So there is some evidence overall. Another one is when we look stress from a clinical perspective, when we think about depression. Uh, there's another meta-analysis uh, in which they did logistic regression, again, among longitudinal studies in adults. and they have seen significant results. So you have a 20% higher risk to be overweight if you are in a depressed uh, group and 58% to even have obesity. So uh, quite significant and strong effects. Then why? That's a question, of course. The first pathway we were thinking about was the fat storage by the cortisol. Just to briefly explain you, the cortisol can favor lipoprotein lipase, an enzyme that will uh, make free fatty acids available, especially in the, um, in the blood vessels around the, the fat. What will happen with these free fatty acids? They will be stored in the fat cells. So you will have more of the fat, mainly visceral, because the cortisol receptors are mainly present in that region. Then, in the presence of insulin, this cortisol can influence also the amount of fat cells and also the, the content of the fat cells. Of course, as you see here, when we think about breakdown of the fat, uh, it can be in two directions. It can lipolyze or antilipolyze. Um, so a lot of other factors will determine uh, in which direction we go. Uh, but overall, if we take all this picture into account, we will think about higher fat deposition by the cortisol. Then a diet, Belgian chocolate, Katadar. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, I was a little bit stressed, so I needed some chocolate. Uh, I opened uh, this one and there were some words of wisdom inside it. And it says, stress would be easier to handle wrapped in chocolate. And this is a good definition of what comfort food is. It's food rich in sugar and fat that we love, that gives some comfort, and that we will mainly eat in certain situations uh, in which we encounter stress. So, the whole idea of comfort foods. Nevertheless, in real life, the picture is a little bit more complex. It depends on the intensity, the person itself, and also the food availability. Thinking about intensity, we have acute and chronic stressors. The acute stressor, we we'll mainly think that it will decrease our food intake. Because in acute stressor, normally we don't think about food, we will react. Uh, also, the sympathetic system, of the autonomic system is really active at that moment, so normally a lower amount, but nowadays in our current society it's mainly the chronic stress, the less intense uh, stress that we uh, perceive, and in that one we will increase. What type of food still depends on the food availability, of course in this current society we have a lot of uh, nice foods around us, very energy dense, uh, not that healthy, rich in fat and sugar, so then we will of course uh, take this comfort food. It depends also on a lot of psychological aspects. For example, if you're an emotional eater, really a person that is sensitive to this aspect, of course you will increase your fat and sugar. For the restrained eaters, we think uh, that they will eat more in general, a higher energy intake from healthy and unhealthy foods. Restrained eaters are people that try to, to eat less, to lose or maintain the weight, so they have some cognitive uh, restraint uh, but this cognitive control will get lost 
and stress situations. And that's the reason why they will um, eat more in certain stress situations. So this is the picture uh, about certain aspects, but then we can also look about physiological aspects, not to go in too much detail, but just to show you that the cortisol can influence reward systems, so the neurotransmitters uh, in our brain, uh, like dopamine, for example, and it can also influence certain hormones. For example, neuropeptide Y, NPY, is a hormone that it will increase food intake. It's an orexigenic uh, hormone, so it will increase in food intake. Insulin and leptin normally decrease food intake, nevertheless, in the presence of cortisol, the idea is that we will get a little bit resistant uh, to insulin and leptin uh, mechanisms, and that we will not decrease, but rather increase the food intake. Um, of course, a lot of this work is also done in animal studies, it's, we try also to uh, translate it to human studies um, to measure it. Of course, the reward pathways are not always that easy, as you can imagine. Okay, this was the diet. Then we think about activity. When we think about stress and activity, it could again be in two directions. So normally, if you are stressed, thinking about the prehistoric times, our body will have some energy available because we need this energy to flight or fight. So the ideal situation would be if we are in chronic stress situation that we also have a good level of physical activity, which is not always uh, the case in our situations. So uh, what do most of us do when they are stressed? They have no time to be physically active and they don't have any motivations uh, to be physically active. Although still some of us uh, can use it as a coping, that would be a good way uh, that we go for a run, for a walk, for a, a cycle, um, just to get rid of our worries. Good to know is that this physical activity can also influence the stress. I forgot to tell you also with the diet, a lot of nut nutrients can influence certain aspects, but I did not go into too much detail because of course time is limited. Uh, but for the physical activity here we see that doing physical activity can give us euphoric effects. It's a way to cope with the stressors. It can decrease also the cortisol uh, stress response. If we do it in a group we get some social support. Nevertheless in extreme situations um, when we think about top sport it can also increase uh, some stress but that will be only a minority. So that was activity, then thinking about sleep. Uh, sleep is in fact a metabolic antagonist of stress. So if we are stressed, uh, the cortisol can inhibit sleep, can also influence the certain sleep phases we are in, so the, sl the deep sleep will, re will be removed. Psychologically, we can also see effects. So uh, if we are stressed, we will think, we will worry, we will ruminate, so we can have problems to fall asleep. Um, and anticipating the next day, for example, and of course, practically, some of us uh, lack some time in stressful situations. Important here is that, of course, we take into account not only the quantity, so the amount of sleep, but also the quality of the sleep, the amount of awakenings, the certain sleep phases you are in. Interesting is that the sleep can also influence our stress perception and stress reactions. So if you have a short sleep, stress hormones like the cortisol can be increased. Uh, on a neural level, uh, we can think about lower performance and lower moods. Um, and of course, we can also have some sleep-related stress. If we don't um, can sleep, we can't sleep, we will worry about that one. Uh, but that's also, again, a minority. So as you see, diet, physical activity and sleep can be linked in two directions and it can be quite complex uh, to see which direction is the case in your sample. Make it more complex from obesity to stress, very briefly. Uh, we have physiological aspects. So obesity is a state of a lot of cytokines, a lot of inflammation. Inflammation can get central uh, to the brain and influence some of our stress pathways. Obesity is also a state of dysregulated cortisol and also leptin increases due to the high uh, fat deposition, factors that can influence, again, the stress level. Apart from physio physiological pathways, we can think about the psychological pathways. People with obesity often have lower self-esteem. They also experience some stigma, some bullying. They have uh, body dissatisfaction, so they are really vulnerable to certain stressors. So physiological and psychological uh, aspects that link adiposity with stress. 
That was the end of the theory behind the relation uh, to diet and obesity. Then have a look at our own results. We did it in children. Why in children? First of all, uh, because childhood is a quite vulnerable period. Um, some origins of lifestyle, some origins of adiposity can start during childhood. The brain is quite vulnerable to certain stressors. Uh, of course, it's a group with less confounders, they make it a little bit more easier. Uh, but still, stress is quite prevalent, even in children. So we can think, of course, a little bit different, although also similar uh, stressors as in uh, adults. Think about family, like divorce, socioeconomic status, uh, disease and death. The friends and society, so the bullying we are thinking about, uh, especially nowadays, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop when you leave school, it's going on online, uh, so really chronic. And then also some pressure, not only from school, but also sometimes of the parents. They are really have nice ambitions for the children uh, in sports, for example, uh, but also a, a general feeling of incompetence, a lack of self-esteem, for example, can also be a stressor. So this is why, now how have you done this? Uh, the CHIP study, Children's Body Composition Stress Study, it started in 2010. It's a Belgian study, only Dutch-speaking uh, children. Uh, we started in 2010, why? Because we take advantage of a European study, the EDIFIC study. Uh, we were part of it, so we had a population sample. Always nice to follow up uh, samples, so that's what we have done. Uh, in 2010, we introduced some stress measures. Uh, then we had 523 children and we tried to follow them up for several years. Originally it was only for another two years, uh, but other projects uh, have made it uh, possible to follow them up for a longer time. As you see, of course, a typical problem with public health and follow-up studies is that you lose your sample and we are almost at half of our sample. So hopefully uh, we will not lose more of them, uh, but we know there is a little bit uh, selection of socioeconomic status also. That's typically. So at the start they were between 5 and 10 over the full uh, three-year period, so we have children between 5 and 12 years old. We had some stress questionnaires to thinking about events, about emotions, about behavior. Then we have, of course, body composition. That was the main outcome that we were looking for. We have typical BMI, uh, but also the waist, the more central one which might be more typical. And then a more advanced measure, the fat percentage with our futuristic butt part device. So it me it's uh, measuring fat percentage based on uh, the movement of air. So it's an equation of volume and pressure. Uh, more easy for children than using, for example, uh, DEXA with, with radiation. And more, um, more uh, a better way than the impedance measures because the impedance measures with a little current uh, typically used are more vulnerable, are more um, influenced by hydration status. So it really depends on when you measure it. Uh, this should be more stable. Underlying hormones, because of course we are interested in physiological uh, aspects, we have stress biomarkers, the cortisol and HRV, the heart availability. We had cortisol beginning in saliva, we also tried it in hair in 2010. Uh, well, I don't have no, I don't have uh, any results here. But the problem was in 2010, the techniques were not that good. Uh, so we had, I think, hair from only girls, uh, because of course for the boys it was more difficult, so we only take girls. Uh, and only of these 200, only 30 of them were above the texture limit. So that was a real problem. Now in 2015, we have repeated the hair cortisol measures. So we take samples uh, and um, no, almost, oh, almost all of them are above the tax limit. So it's a really improvement of the technique. Appetite and adipokines. So uh, leptin, adipotin, ghrelin to have a little bit more insight in the whole physiological pathway to adiposity and diet. Of course, lifestyle with a high focus on diet, not only the food frequency, but also the emotional and external eating. So the eating behaviors. Then we have also some physical activity and screen exposure time and sleep duration. First result is about stress and lifestyle. So this is longitudinally between 2010 and 2012 uh, in which we measured stress and lifestyle and the changes. We have seen that stress was not associated with sleep, nevertheless it was associated with diet and physical activity. 
For the tide, we have seen an overall deterioration of the tide. So those with stress over time had more sweet food intake, so mainly the sweet foods, uh, and also more of the emotional restraint and external eating. It was mainly seen in some subgroups, older children, because of course they will have more control about their own food intake, and especially girls, um, which is in accordance to the adult literature, uh, that girls are more vulnerable to the stress-induced uh, diet. For stress and physical activity, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, it depends on the, on the age. So in the younger children, so this is just median split, in the younger children we had more stress was related to more activity, while in the older, more stress was related to less activity. So in the older ones, it's more in agreement with what we find in adult literature, the unhealthy behavior, nevertheless. So deteriorating diet, changing activity. For diet, we want to look in more detail about cortisol. Uh, we have had a look at sweet foods, about fatty foods, and about specific snacks. Uh, they were all significantly associated with the cortisol. Nevertheless, you can see a more clear pattern when we look at the sweet foods. They were more, uh, more significant and more uh, larger effect sizes. So what you see is that we have four samples for the cortisol. The orange line are those with the highest consumption. The zoot with the, those with the highest sweet food consumption were also those with the higher overall cortisol output, uh, also the higher decline, uh, and also some changes in the cortisol awakening response. Um, so this was the first clue that also in children this cortisol could be um, explaining why we choose for more of the sweet foods. Going further in this whole story we have leptin. Uh, what we have seen is a stress increases leptin. So here again the same graph. The orange is those with the highest leptin and these were also those with the highest cortisol. Then we also were interested in this emotional eating and it became a little bit more complex. Leptin was a moderator. So only in the case of high leptin, so this orange line, only then stress was related to more emotional eating. Uh, so it's leptin that stimulates us to eat, a little bit strange because leptin normally stops us from eating. Uh, but when we look back in the, in the literature, we have seen that stress indeed can induce resistance to the leptin. So of course we cannot prove this in this sample, but that might, this, that might be a possible explanation for these findings. Uh, still under review at this moment. Stress at a positive, the main thing we were interested in, uh, we were looking longitudinally, so we used a specific uh, technique, cross-legged model, why cross-legged? Because we are looking at these cross-legged arrows, uh, it has the advantage that you control for all other longitudinal and cross-sectional associations, making, giving you the, uh, the possibility to see which of these pathways is the strongest one independent from each other. Results, the strongest one was from adiposity to stress, the one we were not really looking for. But okay, more adiposity was more stress, highly significant and quite a high effect size in this population, which surprised us because we still have a quite low overweight uh, prevalence in our sample. But of course we are more interested in the other relation from stress to adiposity, uh, and there it's, again, a little bit more complex. It's a uh, story of moderation. So cortisol li lifestyle, there were moderators. Uh, and more stress was related to more or less adiposity. Um, hmm. This maybe will explain you why. Uh, so we have two types of moderators. We have enhancing moderators and we have protective moderators. In this case, cortisol and the diet were enhancing moderators. So it means if you have high stress, together with the preference for unhealthy diet and also the high cortisol, so if the stress really gets under the skin, then that adiposity will increase over time. So it enhances the stress at a positive relation. Underneath we have the protective moderator. In the case of stress with a high level of physical activity, we can maybe see also some lower at a positive levels. So the physical activity is protecting us from stress induced that adiposity increases. So this is quite new, while this is in fact uh, a little bit uh, an agreement with the literature that we have. So stress adiposity. We were not happy yet. We also wanted to look broader, not only adiposity, but metabolic syndrome. Uh, metabolic syndrome is composed of four components. We have the waste, we have the glucose homeostasis, the cholesterol homeostasis, uh, and the blood pressure. 
Um, first, for race, we didn't find any significant results. Um, but for the um, glucose homeostasis, it was mainly associated with a high cortisol and certain stressors. For lipids, it was also the cortisol and uh, some behavior problems. While for the blood pressure, it was mainly the parasympathetic activity, so the autonomic activity. So here you see already a difference between the two main stress systems, the cortisol and the autonomic system, in their uh, role uh, of metabolic syndrome. This one is what we would expect, indeed, the autonomic system is responsible uh, for blood pressure changes. Okay, a whole story just to take into account what have we learned here. First of all, we have learned that stress in children can deteriorate already their diet and also influence their physical activity. Nevertheless, not all of them are reacting in the same way. Some will increase, some will decrease physical activity. So as a conclusion that this lifestyle and this cortisol can be protective or vulnerable factors in the stress induced at a positive. So it's a story of moderator, moderation. Fourth and last, what we have seen is that adiposity can also induce stress even in a low adiposity population. So it's not only induced with very uh, obese numbers. What does this mean? It means that we really should take into account multidisciplinary research, not only think about physiology but also psychology, long term research to see which direction, complexity in thinking moderator and mediator. Use of biomarkers, because we indeed we have shown that cortisol, uh, for example, might be really interesting, and that even in children, in young children, we can already see these type of associations. Of course, these interesting results uh, have forwarded us to do some more related projects. We have tried to, ha uh, to test the same hypothesis in Swiss preschoolers from the Balabena study, in which we don't have stress but quality of life, and in fact we have seen the same uh, results. Uh, we also are doing this now in the I family study, a European study, in which there is a PhD in quality of life and metabolic syndrome, uh, or a PhD on rewarding healthy food cho choices on telomeres, uh, about genetic aspects and inflammation, body size ideals, and we also have the Belgian health survey data uh, in which we can similar hypothesis, uh, although cross-sectionally. But of course, it's a bigger sample than we have. Implications. Um, from all what we have learned, of course, if we are looking in child populations, we should also take into account schools and parents and the broader community to give a certain environment of physical activity and diet and to give some psychological uh, support. Stress management is really important. Um, teaching them some stress coping skills, how to handle the stress, because it was a reaction to stress that was really important. The social support and self-esteem. Of course, we can treat stress when it's there, a lot of uh, psychological treatments, pharmacological treatments, but in fact, in not uh, too extreme situations, physical activity can be a good treatment also. Um, that's showing you the importance of lifestyle. We should encourage a healthy environment which offers opportunities for physical activity, healthy foods, uh, the classical story, but also awareness for emotional eating. And finally, if we have obese people, uh, we should give them psychosocial support to prevent a whole vicious circle from stress to the positive and the positive to stress. Um, looking in the Cochrane review um, to show you what is the best treatment for childhood obesity, they came to the conclusion it's a combination of nutrition, physical activity, but also psychology. So a little bit uh, the same story again. Mindfulness is uh, a hype uh, these times. Um, more and more um, good research is done on this mindfulness, uh, although a lot of them are still ongoing. Um, some promising results, emotional and binge eating, might be uh, affected by the mindfulness. Nevertheless, effects on weight are more difficult to reach. Um, in fact, it's again a good combination that is important. Uh, mindfulness, cognitive behavior therapies, mindful eating, but also the diet and activity should, should always be integrated. It's not a psychology as such that will uh, help us, uh, but more research is for sure necessary. We try to make a review, descriptive review, with a framework on the importance of emotional regulation. It's just uh, an EPUB nowadays. 
um, showing you that emotion regulation via different pathways can lead to ob obesity. But if we have effective coping strategies, that is the most important. So we should enhance certain skills, uh, even at young age, for example, at school, uh, making people aware of their emotions, understanding emotions, changing emotions, but also the self-esteem uh, and this uh, resilience. This is a new term, the resilience. But of course, parents can play a role in this whole uh, perspective. Future projects. Four future projects. Emotion regulation, so we have done a review because of a reason. We want to do an emotion regulation intervention. So we are working together with a psychology department. This is the whole framework behind it. It's just the idea that emotion regulation can be a treatment or a preventive um, way. And that underlying pathways are the stress physiology, physiology the inflammation, and emotional eating. We want to do a certain a type of contrasting study in which we compare the children, longitudinal, the same cohort, like uh, I have mentioned already, comparing them, the high stress versus the low stress, due to, due to, and of course, in taking into account the increase or decreases of adiposity, and comparing them on certain psychological uh, aspects uh, about uh, inflammation, uh, but also we want to introduce uh, the metabolomic uh, aspect, so a very broad um, examination of all types of metabolites to have some certain explanations why some increase and others not increase if they have high stress levels. And a final uh, thing is intervention in healthy children that are a little bit at risk for stress but also in obese children. Hopefully we will see results on lifestyle in the long term it will be difficult on a deposit, uh, but we also hope some physiological aspects and maybe on inflammation. Um, it can be an effect on inflammation, really independent also from the adiposity. Uh, but we will see, we are applying for funds and hopefully can start in January. The whole picture of the guts, um, inflammation and gut bacteria have something to do with it. Just to say you, to tell you, a lot of you know already, we have trillions of bacteria in our gut and they are not only important for digestion and for uh, the immunity but also they have a bi-directional uh, connection to the brain so if we go from the brain the stress level to the gut we can think about the cortisol and about the nervous vagus the parasympathetic activity uh, when we go from the gut to the brain uh, we can we can again, again think about the vagus nerve, so certain bacteria can stimulate uh, this parasympathetic activity, but they can also stimulate cytokine productions that can go to the brain very shortly and briefly. Uh, but more important, they can also influence neurotransmitter production and as such influence the brain. So this is just one of the reviews you can find on this. I will not go into too much detail. Just to give you a little bit view of the design that we have, the idea is that stress can influence obesity, obesity can influence stress, with the gut microbiota, the inflammation and diet as an intermediate uh, perspective. We want to do it observational, contrasting. Uh, at this moment we try to convince the ethical committee for a recruitment of children with depression, uh, to compare them with our healthy children, uh, on a lot of factors, but also the gut microbiota. Uh, so we hopefully can start with this in the summer. Uh, and finally, and then not in the near future, uh, we can also think of uh, certain uh, interventions, for example, prebiotics uh, in depression, if we see differences, of course. And the first result that we have is that different uh, bacterial pr products, short-term fatty acids that are produced by the good bacteria, are different between the stressed and the non-stressed uh, children. Uh, so uh, this is just ongoing. Third one is examination stress and diet. Uh, so we want to check uh, diet in students before and during examination, see what happens. And we would expect that certain of them will have an unhealthier diet, may maybe in energy, maybe in choices. But no, we want to explain, not from a physiological uh, perspective, but more of a lifestyle and psychological perspective, why some do and why others don't. Uh, thinking about psychological perspectives, uh, reward sensitivity, coping, uh, but also lifestyle, the physical activity they do, uh, demographics, maybe boys, girls, social environment, the support they get. Uh, so a lot of uh, measures more in a uh, questionnaire based uh, way. And this is a master thesis that will start in September. 
Finally, uh, again applying for a national grant, uh, is in uh, young adults. So we had uh, adolescents from the Helena study, European study, they were between 12 and 18. If we would follow them up now, of course this is only the Belgian subgroup, uh, they were between 20 and 30, so young, hopefully still healthy um, adults. What we want to check is the effects of lifestyle, a very uh, large bunch of lifestyle factors. Uh, of course, stress is one of them, but also nutrition and physical activity on the outcomes, cognitive function and cardiovascular function. So here we're also working together uh, with a cardiologist because I'm not really um, well known with all these uh, type of measures. So a real um, in-depth measure of cardiovascular health and the in-between outcomes in which also the gut micro microbiota come again, inflammation, but also the more advanced measures like the metabolomics and the epigenetics. So this would be a very nice project to get funded. Uh, nevertheless, we were not uh, available to do that yet, um, but we hope for further response. Nevertheless, we hope to start even in September. So even without funds, we go for it. This was just to show you that even in a public health perspective, in a biological perspective, you can introduce some of the more advanced measures, not only the typical biomarkers like the cortisol and some hormones, but also the gut microbiota, just showing you some changes uh, between uh, a prenatal stress, yeah, prenatal stress group and a not prenatal stress group. Changes seem not that big, but as you see, for example, the, the pink ones are very high in this group and not in this group, it's actinobacteria. Uh, the telomeres, so the ends of the chromosomes that protect us from aging, can also be interesting in aging research. And then the metabolomics, so it's measuring a lot of metabolites and looking whether they are related with stress or obesity. This was a case for obesity in which they tested, um, in fact the conclusion was that mainly the amino acid and the lipid Metabolites were important, but of course also um, a lot of other perspectives. This is our group. Uh, at this moment, we are not with a large amount. Uh, one of our main postdocs left the group, so I'm the only remaining postdoc. Nevertheless, in September, another one will uh, join us. And we are applying for a lot of grants uh, to hopefully get some more PhD students. Um, and finally, some related collaborations on a national and an international perspective, because of course we can't know uh, we can't be expert in all these fields, uh, so we always try to combine several aspects. And with this, I would like to thank you.